everybody good evening good morning and uh, whatever time of the day it is for so many friends across the world and thank you so much for joining in for this session of east meets west as you all all know this is the, our third session of our webinar that we have been conducting for the last about 8 or 9 months we started in august last year we did our first session on selective cannulation techniques and then we had another very interesting session on emr techniques in november and this time we bring to you the a session on endoscopic ultrasound as you all all know the foundation for research and education in endoscopy is a non profit organization which is dedicated towards education and research in endoscopy and we run this out of india although we have global presence now and we're trying to get global presence with uh, all our faculty joining in thanks to them now today's session is basically on how to optimize yield of endoscopic ultrasound and eos guided tissue acquisition now the concept of this webinar which we call as east meets west is to try and bring together the world of interventional endoscopy the idea is to mix and compare and contrast as well as try and bring together the policies and the practices that are used in the east as compared to what they are used in the west because we all know that each one of us has our own references choices idiosyncrasies as we might call them but then it's good to understand what the other person is doing so that we can learn from each other and that is the thought process that we started this webinar uh, series with and i'm thankful to my course director dr truptesh kothari who has so kindly you know been part of this right from the beginning and he is spearheading the uh, this mission from the west and uh, i try and do my bit for the east so today from the east we have two star faculty dr nanthali pawsawasti from uh, bangkok and she is joined with by uh, dr surinder rana professor at postgraduate institute of medical research at chandigarh in india <clears throat> and uh, now i will hand over to dr truptesh for his side of the story and his introduction of his faculty over to you truptesh thanks amol good morning everybody uh, to the people in uh, west and uh, it's basically pretty cold over here right now anand sahai was just telling me that he is right now dealing with minus 35 degrees i am dealing with minus 5 degrees as of this point so it was freezing cold but anyways it's very nice to have everybody back and as amol said this is our third session and uh, this was a very highly requested uh, in demand topic and we had to scratch our heads to get the star faculties and we actually were lucky to get the gurus of eus so i have the privilege of uh, introducing the star two faculties uh, from our side the first one to go is uh, dr rob house he is uh, doesn't need any introduction uh, he is the eus guru he is a professor at orlando health digestive health institute center for advanced endoscopy research and education in orlando florida and one more star faculty which i have been hearing since my of fellowship and uh, that's dr anand sahai he is a professor of medicine chief division of gi at chum hospital st leve montreal in canada uh with uh, not losing the time anymore i would like to request dr hoss to start his presentation and it's open to him dr hoss please okay let me uh so i think you, maybe we need to take your screen down for me to share yeah that's okay. that's right. 
Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here, and um, I'm. Uh, it's a pleasure to 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 sit in our office, uh, and we're not together physically, but to look out over the screen and and see some really uh, fantastic friends uh, on the other side of the screen. So I'm I'm delighted to be a part of this. Uh, I congratulate uh, Amal and and Truptesh for uh, putting this thing together, and uh, I hope that uh, in the end. Uh, we will have benefited uh, those listening uh, in terms of, uh, of EUS. The assignment that I was given is principles and technique of linear examination and basic techniques of EUS F and B. And I'm basically setting up the, the stage for the other uh, presenters. And um, moving forward, these are my disclosures uh, if they are appropriate. And then I, I want to start out uh, just with a little bit of an advertisement, only because um, we have now introduced uh, the fifth uh, edition of our textbook uh, of end, uh, called Endosonography. So this is actually available now for sales. And I, I mention it here only because from the very beginning with the Endosonography textbook, we have dedicated sections on how to perform EUS in various areas. And so uh, in the first part of my presentation, everything that I'm presenting uh, is in video form and in written form uh, in the, this textbook of, of endosonography. The second thing is, is that Anand uh, actually um, uh, produced the chapter on FNA, FNB. So I think that probably the principles that you hear from all of the speakers will be presented in Anand's chapter. So um, just a, a little bit of a, a heads up that the endosonography, the fifth edition is now out uh, and I encourage all of you to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get it. So why this station technique? This is uh, what I've been preaching uh, for a very, very long time in terms of teaching how to uh, examine the pancreatic biliary tree. And it was developed as a mechanism to teach new fellows. Uh, we were deluged with people who wanted to learn EUS uh, early on in the, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, and we had to develop a way to teach fellows. And so that was one of the reasons for the station technique. Uh, it begins with endoscopic position. So all of the fellows uh, that would come and learn uh, obviously knew the endoscopic positions where we wanted them to start their EUS examination. So it, it, it was a good translation to their experience. Uh, it was based, a, a, at least in part, on extracorporeal ultrasound. Uh, and um, with extracorporeal ultrasound, at least in the United States, they take standard pictures from standard positions. And that uh, formed a basis for what we wanted to do with EUS. It also, if you follow all of the pancreatic stations, it will ensure that you've got as complete an imaging as possible uh, of the pancreas and, and the bile duct. And then it's based on recognizing surrounding structures. So that's a, an important part of the, the station technique. And then uh, when you're actually doing it, there are principles that you should follow uh, as you're actually doing the examination. Again, it's based on an understanding of the standard anatomy in certain endoscopic positions. So I'll explain that uh, here, both in, in slide form and video form uh, in just a moment. When you begin a station, a particular station, you should visualize certain key structures. So if you don't see those key structures, then you're not in the proper position to start the examination. Once the structures are identified, then it's a matter of tracing. And tracing um, is, is an art uh, and a skill. It's not something that's uh, just inherent, uh, inherent to uh, a young endosonographer. You have to learn how to trace things. And then while you're tracing, and this happens early on in your career, while you're tracing, you oftentimes will get lost. And what happened to me uh, early on in my experience um, is I would get lost and then I would try to retrieve the position. 
And I would spend a long time uh, trying to reconstruct um, where I was. And in the process of doing so, it's what I call the mirage effect. You begin to think that uh, this particular duct absolutely has to be, or this particular structure has to be the pancreatic duct. And then you find out that it's actually the splenic artery and, and uh, you're, you're, you're really messed up. So that uh, if you get lost when you're tracing, then we encourage the young endosonographer to stop, go back to the original endoscopic position and start over. Another principle is that if you cannot adequately visualize a particular station after two or three tries, then move on, go to a different area and then come back to that station. And frequently when you come back, you can get the imaging that you desire. And then I, I encourage everybody to take standard pictures, um, pictures of the body of the pancreas with the kidney in the, in the uh, deep in the image and, and, and so forth. So try to take some standard pictures to document that you've done a complete examination. So the pancreas stations uh, begin with uh, just, it's an arbitrary station one. This is uh, deep in the duodenum. Uh, it's achieved by uh, what we normally do with ERCP where we go long scope, get into the second portion of the duodenum uh, and then straighten the scope. And when we straighten the scope, uh, inevitably we uh, jettison ourselves past uh, the ampulla of Vodder. And so this is a deep uh, duodenal station. And you know uh, that you're in the right position if you actually torque, usually counterclockwise, and see the aorta. If you see the aorta from deep in the, in the duodenum, then if you torque clockwise, you will get pancreas uh, right next to the aorta, just as it he is here in this picture. And uh, if you can achieve that, i.e. get the aorta and then torque and get the pancreas next to the aorta, then you have achieved imaging of the unsinate process at least as well as you can get. So that's station one. Station two is uh, what I affectionately call kissing the papilla. It's a station that's designed to allow you to examine the amp ampulla and also to trace the pancreatic duct, which goes deep, and the bile duct, which goes superficial at the level of the ampulla. Uh, this is a station that's absolutely necessary when you're staging an ampullary carcinoma. But this is station two, uh, it's called kissing the papilla. You can usually with an EUS scope endoscopically visualize the ampulla, and then you just go up on your up down uh, to quote unquote kiss it. Uh, and then you begin this maneuver. Station three uh, is actually uh, the apex of the duodenal bulb. It should be achieved by beginning in the stomach. So uh, to achieve this position, you should begin in the stomach, do the general maneuver that you do with ERCP where you uh, insert the scope, it, it tracks along the greater curve, uh, you go up, you pop through the pylorus, you go down on your up down to visualize the apex of the duodenal bulb, and then you begin visualizing. The, the point is, is that the scope should be in a long scope position in order to get the best imaging here. And the key structure that you're looking for is the portal vein and the portal vein confluence. Uh, as, a, as a shout out to Anand, I call this the hockey stick uh, image. Uh, you sort of get the, um, uh, the portal vein and sort of a hockey stick uh, kind of a confirmation. If you can achieve that, then through tracing, you'll get the head of the pancreas coming around the, the confluence. The bile duct will be imaged between the portal vein and the transducer in this area here. And then it's a matter of tracing the rest of the head of the pancreas. This is a, a key position for doing FNA on pancreatic head masses. And then station four uh, begins at the GE junction. Um, and uh, your landmarks here are the aorta. So you uh, start at the G endoscopically at the GE junction, you find the aorta uh, and between the aorta and the transducer will be the pura of the diaphragm. 
as you push in, the cura would disappear. And as soon as the cura disappears, the celiac artery comes off. You trace the celiac artery until it bifurcates. And then right beyond the bifurcation, you will pick up the pancreas. Generally, the body of the pancreas is picked up here. And then it's a matter of tracing. So I'll move forward here. This is a, 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 a essentially an unedited video of these stations. And uh, I, I, I actually start with station one. So I, excuse me, for station four. So uh, I'll go in reverse order that I just presented. So endoscopically, I'm uh, uh, in the stomach now. I'm withdrawing until I get to the GE junction, a squamocolumnar junction, that general area. Then uh, tip up on your up down to, uh, to connect to the, uh, to the gut wall and then uh, begin imaging. And almost inevitably, it will be the liver that you will see first. You torque uh, clockwise usually, and then you will get the aorta. Here is the uh, cura of the diaphragm. So I'm tracing the cura of the diaphragm. It ends, and then you come up with the celiac artery. I'm gonna trace the celiac artery. There's the bifurcation of the celiac artery, tip down a little bit, and then you get into pancreas. This is the portal vein, a portal vein confluence, splenic vein uh, area here. This is pancreas up here. So now it's a little bit of gentle torquing clockwise, counterclockwise, a little bit of withdrawing the scope in order to see um, the body and tail of the pancreas I've withdrawn. Here's the kidney. Okay, so the kidney sort of demarcates the, the body and tail uh, of, the, of the pancreas. I'm uh, withdrawing here a little bit further. Uh, here is a splenic vein, here's a splenic artery, and then here is the spleen. Uh, so I'm now in the splenic hilum. So if you visualize the pancreas all the way to the splenic hilum, then you can assure that you've seen all of the pancreas, at least in terms of the tail. And now again, it's just a matter of tracing. I've traced back, I've pushed in. Here's the portal vein uh, and the portal vein confluence. You can see the, the pancreas in the neck of the pancreas going uh, down uh, beyond the portal vein confluence. So that is um, uh, essentially station one. Now I'm going long scope, uh, pushing the scope in along the greater curve. I've popped through the pylorus. I go down on my up down and now I'm visualizing the apex of the duodenal bulb. Uh, and then I, I go up on my up down and, and here now I'm, I'm struggling a little bit because uh, I don't have the portal vein yet. Uh, so that's the key. Here is the portal vein. Here's the hockey stick. So now I'm in good shape. This is the, the uh, bile duct between the portal vein and the transducer. This is basically uh, pancreas in this area here. And so now it's, a, it's, again, it's a matter of tracing, and this takes uh, experience. Uh, generally, torquing uh, clockwise brings the the uh, bile duct and the pancreatic duct deep down to it, down to the, to the uh, duodenum, to the duodenal wall, torquing counterclockwise, traces the bile duct up toward the hilum of the liver uh, in, in that area there. But it's a, uh, just a matter of tracing and you go back and forth as much as you need to. I point out here uh, that you can see this uh, difference in the echo architecture in this area here. This is the ventral onlaga, and this is the dorsal onlaga, much more um, uniform echo architecture to the dorsal onlaga. Uh, the ventral onlaga is a little bit more heterogeneous uh, because of less fat, uh, but here's the bile duct, here's the pancreatic duct deep to it. Uh, and that is basically the apical position. Now I'm gonna go down into the second portion of the duodenum. Please, when you're doing this maneuver, uh, try to engage the apex and then try to pull on the scope. Don't push your way around the apex. This is an area where you can potentially perforate uh, that and the uh, upper esophageal uh, sphincter uh, are the two areas uh, most likely to perforate. So now I've, I've shortened the scope uh, and I'm beginning to image. 
unfortunately, I don't show the aorta here, and I apologize for that. Uh, but if I torqued left, the aorta would be here, and you can begin to see the pancreas uh, here. So now it's a matter of just pulling back and torquing left and right. Uh, this is the, the unsonate process of the pancreas here. Uh, and I'm just going to continue uh, withdrawing the echo endoscope, torquing left and right to make sure that I see all of the pancreas. And then what I'm looking for is the beginning of this ventral onlaga, because this uh, uh, tells me when uh, I can expect to, to try to see the pancreatic duct and the bile duct. So here is the ventral onlaga. Here is the pancreatic duct. Here is the bile duct on top. And then you can trace these as you will. Uh, again, this is an important position if you're staging ampullary cancer. It's also a critical position if you're looking for a bile duct stone because uh, they, they can be impacted in the ampulla. All you'll see is some shadowing uh, as evidence of a stone. But here you can see the pancreatic duct, the bile duct on top, and you can trace those on through the ventral onlaga. If you can see the pancreatic duct go from the ventral onlaga into this more uniform uh, dorsal onlaga, then you know for sure that the patient does not have pancreas divisum, as is the case here. You can trace the pancreatic duct from the ventral onlaga to the dorsal onlaga. So now I can say in my report that this patient definitely does not have pancreas divisum. So those are the, the basic stations uh, and uh, you can go back and forth, spend as much time uh, uh, on each of these stations as you need. Uh, you can use Doppler and color Doppler uh, to distinguish vessels uh, from uh, ductal structures, et cetera. Uh, you can go back and forth, spend as much time as you need to, but that is basically um, the pancreatic stations and the biliary stations uh, for EUS. So there are a couple of potential miss areas. Uh, one of them is the unsonate process. I think Anand may be talking a little bit about this, but uh, the solution is basically what I said, get deep into the, to the uh, second, third portion of the duodenum. And if you can visualize the aorta uh, from that position, if you torque, uh, then you'll pick up on the unsonate process. And that's as good as you can do um, with, uh, with EUS. The other tricky area is really at the level of the pylorus. And uh, I have missed cancers. I'm uh, a little bit distressed to say, but I've missed cancers that are right at that neck uh, because as you pull back, uh, you flip through into the, uh, into the stomach uh, and it's a not, not a very stable position. But uh, the solution, uh, as best you can, is to, is to withdraw slowly. When you get into the duodenal bulb, I inflate the balloon uh, to the greatest degree possible, which sort of keeps me uh, in the duodenal bulb. And then I sort of intersusept the duodenal bulb into the stomach in hopes that I can get a stable position to, to uh, visualize um, the uh, sort of the neck of the pancreas or that area right next to the, um, uh, to the uh, pylorus. So now uh, I wanna move on to FNB uh, or FNA. And um, the bottom line is, is that my tact on this is I'm going to um, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of quit on it, if you will, because uh, I think there are simply too many variables uh, to state what the best technique is. I've, I've tried to, to teach uh, FNA, I've tried to lecture it all over the world, and um, there are just too many variables. Uh, so there is no best technique uh, that covers the entire world. The problem is, is that there's high variability in pathology. There are many parts of the world that do not have a cytopathology. There's some parts of the world that have cytopathology, but it's bad cytopathologists. Um, most everybody has histopathology, but that histopathology may be good or, or not so good. So uh, pathology varies across the country. There are economic considerations. Um, maybe the best needle is not affordable in certain uh, areas of the country. 
Um, there is huge bias. Um, I'm amazed at, um, as I travel a, across the world um, and try to put some, some data behind um, FNA techniques, and I would, uh, I, I would venture to say that, that, that our group, uh, as a single group, has produced as many or more studies on tissue acquisition as any group in the, in the world. And I, I think for sure we've done more randomized trials. But as we present this data, it's almost like people don't listen uh, and they just have their own bias. Well, this needle with this technique, I get perfect tissue every single time and I'm not gonna change. And, and so I don't think I can change anybody um, with uh, my brief presentation here. We've been advocates of Rose uh, for a long time and I realize that Rose is not available everywhere. Uh, Anand used to use Rose and now he doesn't use Rose. And, and so um, uh, I just, I, I throw that out there. It's one of those variables and, and, and so forth. I show this slide only because um, actually EUS FNA is gotten really pretty good. I show this slide, this was a, a, a randomized trial that we did. It was using a standard bevel needle uh, we were testing suction versus no suction with uh, 25 gauge and 22 gauge needles. The point of, of me presenting this slide is only that the overall diagnostic accuracy using rows was 97%. So um, uh, whatever you use, uh, you should be getting very, very good results uh, with your EUS FNA. And we would go back uh, where we continue to be advocates of rows, but uh, using this technique, we're really getting very, very good results. Uh, this slide I'm, I'm pushing out uh, mainly for discussion. So I'm gonna put out here for everybody to critique that the best technique for FNB is to use a 22 gauge FNB needle. You should use the fanning technique, and I'm sure Anand will discuss this at great length. Um, we, we are speaking the same language. I think uh, Anand doesn't like the term fanning, but uh, it's basically described in the same technique. Uh, we, in a recent study, uh, looked at stylet retraction uh, for Fork, Tip, and Francine, and that gave the best um, uh, results. I know there are many people that don't believe in, in stylet retraction, but at least in our randomized trial, this worked best for these FNB needles, and then the specimen collection should be put in formula. So I'm gonna to toss that out there for everybody to critique and, and hopefully we'll have lots of questions for it. The reason that I put this out uh, is based upon our studies. We looked at the Francine type needle, an FNB needle versus a standard bevel needle. Uh, and basically the diagnostic accuracy was quite high for both of them. However, uh, the cell block adequacy was significantly better for the Francine needle than versus the standard needle. We went to great lengths to measure sort of the amount of tissue uh, and the quality of the tissue that was, uh, that was achieved when we looked at Francine versus standard, and they were statistically significant in all of these sophisticated measures of the volume and quality of tissue. So based upon this, we think that going forward uh, in an ideal world, you use um, the uh, FNB type needles. This was our attempt to uh, put um, uh, sort of objective data on this idea of fanning. Fanning simply means that when you do a, a, a pass for, for FNA, that the, you go back and forth three or four times in multiple trajectories through the tumor that start at one side of the tumor and extend all the way to the other side so that you uh, basically cover the entire area of the tumor. And what this study showed is, is that uh, using the fanning technique, you could get a highly accurate diagnosis with fewer passes and that you had an almost an 86% accuracy with one pass only. So um, I, again, I think Anand will talk more about this. 
but uh, you should not uh, take one trajectory through the tumor. You should cover the entire span of the tumor. And then this is another uh, data about uh, the adequacy of tissue primarily for doing molecular analysis. We looked at the Francine and the fork tip needle, and basically uh, with stylet retraction, uh, we got the best diagnostic uh, adequacy uh, using uh, these two needles, and we got a very high uh, amount of cellularity. With the uh, reverse bevel needle and with a Mangini needle, uh, the results were uh, significantly less uh, good. And so with the F and B needles, performing a single pass got diagnostic adequacy greater than 90% of the time. If you use these other bevel needles, then it required at least three passes uh, that may be required to get this 90% uh, tissue adequacy rate. So again, I'll toss this out there for further discussion. If you're going forward with FNB, it's a 22 gauge needle, it's an FNB needle, you do use, need to use the fanning technique, stylet retraction and put the specimen in formalin to get the overall best results. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude uh, and uh, just a, a little bit of an advertisement uh, for our live EUS meeting coming up in, uh, in uh, August. We'll have a, an all-star faculty for that. And again, uh, for those of you who find yourselves in Orlando, we'd, we'd love to have you visit us uh, at our uh, Digestive Health Institute and uh, uh, we'd welcome uh, your visit. So with that, I'll conclude. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for, uh, for listening. Thank you, Rob, and uh, wonderful uh, presentation and talk as usual on the technique of EUS and you know, who, who else could have given it better than Rob himself. So, so to move on, we have our next speaker from the East, Dr. Nantali Pausawasti. And before I introduce Nantali, I would just like to make some housekeeping announcements that uh, for all attendees, if you want to ask questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will be happy to take them, over, take them up during the discussion uh, part of the meeting. And uh, so that you don't forget to you know, put that question and, uh, so that uh, if it goes to another session. So, so Nantali is going to uh, Dr. Nantali is the is the press, uh, currently the president of the Thai Association of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy or the TAGE as we all know it and it's a very active group in the uh, southeast and she's also the associate professor of medicine and the division of gastroenterology and uh, at the Sri Raj Hospital Mahidol University in Bangkok Thailand. And she's going to be talking about uh, basics of EU's guided tissue axial acquisition, particularly focusing on the choosing the right needle, how to prepare your slides, yeah. and a few words about rows and mows and what they do in the units. So over to you, Nantali. Thank you so much, Amal. Um, and first of all, I want to thank both Amal and Triptesh for the invitation. I'm so happy and honored to be part of this panel. Um, do you see my slide? You see my slide, okay? Yeah, we can see it. Right. Good. Yeah. So my task today is to talk about basic of US guided tissue acquisition. And um, I'm happy to talk after Rob because um, I really feel that um, he has really um, established good practice in EUS for us. So um, the key factors for successful EUS guided tissue acquisition is um, including needle selection, aspiration and suction technique, tissue handling and processing. Needle characteristics, needle performance, and the location of the um, lesions are important factors for um, guiding needle selection. Generally, the smaller needles are more flexible, easier to puncture difficult locations like pancreatic head or unseated process, and causing less blood contamination. Both 
aspiration and biopsy needles are currently available in the market. The main drawback of the FNA needle or aspiration needle is lack of tissue architecture and limiting diagnostic accuracy of several conditions. FNB has been designed to overcome these limitations. The first generation of FNB needles, which is true cut, I don't think we use this anymore. The second generation is a reverse bevel. Um, we, 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 we use, I use some of these um, uh, these days, but currently I'm moving forward to using third generation of biopsy needles, including the fork tip, the Francine, and the forward bevel needles, and they come in different sizes. Several RCT and meta-analysis have been performed to compare the performance of FNA and FNB. So far, FNB needles have been shown to be more superior to FNA needles in terms of tissue adequacy, quality, diagnostic accuracy. FNB requires less procedure time, uh, fewer passes, and it can be done without rows. Uh, it has a very good safety profile, as good as the FNA needle. And um, as far as the cost, it, I think it really depends on where you practice. Like, for example, in Thailand, where I practice, the cost of FNB needle is actually um, higher than FNA needle. However, the FNB can provide enough tissue for molecular diagnosis and personalized medicine. So, in my practice, FNB has really replaced FNA needles. But when we compare different types of FNB needle, the third generations, including Francine, fork tip, and forward bevel, are superior to the reverse bevel. Now, moving on to the um, location of the target lesion. Well, I think the location is one of the important factor for needle selection. For easy location like um, uh, esophagus or a stomach, any needle would work because the scope doesn't bend very much. But for um, difficult location like ga gastric fundus, head with pancreas or uncinate process, the scope can bend quite a bit and therefore smaller needles or more flexible needles are required in this uh, location. Now, moving on to um, aspiration technique. Well, there are several aspiration techniques or puncture techniques like standard technique, door knocking with peg and lock jam have been described. The um, uh, direction of the needles, uh, fanning is a standard um, uh, of practice now, as Rob had mentioned earlier. There are several suction methods have been proposed, including the dry suction, which is a, a 10 to 20 negative pressure or wet suction using saline, stylus slow pull, or capillary technique, or no suction at all. Uh, I have some videos to show you different um, uh, techniques, aspiration techniques for um, uh, tissue guided acquisition. Uh, here is a video showing door knocking technique. It can be performed by advancing the needle in quickly, allowing handle to hit the stopper, creating a door knocking sound, and pull back slowly during the stroke. This one is woodpecker technique, requires moving the needle finely and rapidly within the lesion. I think this technique is very good for a lesion of less than one centimeter. And here is a demonstration of, of um, fanning technique. Basically, the needle trajectory using fanning method will allow the tissue to be sampled from different areas of the lesion. Based on the current literature, FNA literature, fanning technique is recommended. And as I said, it, it, I think it's standard practice. The door knocking method appears to increase cellularity, but not diagnostic accuracy, however, uh, study is quite limited on that. For number of passes, three to four passes may be required if you use FNA without rows. However, for FNB without rows, only two to three passes are required. In my practice, uh, only one to two passes are required when FNB needle is used. Um, the, uh, the use of stylet is no longer needed. As for suction, the data demonstrates that standard suction is better than no suction in terms of diagnostic yield, 
wet suction or stylus slow pull um, can be effective. And I think that these different suction techniques can be selected based on the endoscenographer's preference. What about F and B data? I just want to emphasize that this study, which was done by Rob's group, um, G Bang and Chiam, they had nicely demonstrated the suction technique to obtain optimal outcomes for each F and B needle type. As Rob had mentioned earlier, stylus slow pull or stylet retraction is quite good for francine and frog tip type needle. Uh, for a suction, uh, it seems to be better with the reverse or forward bevel. So I think that different techniques may be required if you use different needle um, types. Now, moving on to the last thing about tissue processing. Uh, traditionally, ROSE has the biggest impact um, with increased diagnostic accuracy and decreased needle passes for FNA. However, the recent data show that ROSE does not really affect the results of FNA in large volume center. And with the use of FNB needles um, uh, with or without ROSE, it doesn't seem to matter much anymore if FNB needles are used. And here is a video demonstrating how we do ROS in our center. Here you prepare the slides. Once you get this, the aspirates, you expel it on the, the, the glass slides and our pathologist is doing the smear. You can see a lot of tissue there using F and B needles. And here they put the um, more of the core tissue in the um, uh, fixative agent. And here at the bedside, we're doing a quick dip starting with the uh, uh, alcohol fixation and then eosin and, and hematoxylin. And here the pathologist is looking at the uh, beautiful uh, uh, group of cells right here. This patient's had um, metastatic um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the breast to the pancreas. What about if you don't have rows at your center? Most is one thing that you can use uh, known, uh, most is known as macroscopic onsite evaluation. Uh, the data show that tissue length of more than four millimeter is indicative of tissue adequacy. And the tissue like this can be placed in formalin fix for histological evaluation. The row of MOAS in the absence of rows in both FNA and FNB is expanding. Uh, here are some summaries of studies looking at the utility of MOAS on the diagnostic accuracy using different type of needles both FNA and FNB needles. As you can see here, without rows, the diagnostic accuracy is reaching a 97%. And we have found that the visible core of more than four millimeter is really indicative of tissue adequacy. With that, I'd like to conclude that in my practice, I think when I, well, when, when I do um, US guided FNB, I use fanning technique. Um, the different aspiration methods can be applied depending on the, uh, the, the, the nature of the lesion. Stylus slow pull um, uh, is done first for all needle types and lesions. If I fail to obtain any tissue, then I would add 5 ml of negative pressure or dry suction. I don't use 10 or 20 because I think it creates a lot of blood contamination. For needle selection, I always go with the 22 gauge FNB needle first. Um, I use Francine frog tip forward bevel, depending on what's there um, uh, in the unit at that time. However, if I have difficulty passing the needle, the 22 gauge needle into a certain location, like Anzine process, I might select to use 25 gauge needle. I always apply MOAS in my practice. It's a good alternative for ROAS because we do not have ROAS present at our center. And I prepare my sample for formal fixation after using FNB needles. I think in the future, we're gonna see more of FNB in terms of um, molecular analysis. And also I think sampling techniques can be more refined for each um, FNB type. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nantali. That was a great talk as usual. And uh, we appreciate you taking out time for today. The next speaker without losing any time would be Dr. Anand Sahai. And we would have his slides on the screen, please.
Good morning. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, participate today. It's great to see uh, uh, all these friends that we haven't seen in person for a while, but hopefully that'll come back at some point. Okay, um, and a minute. Do you want me to show the share slides yes. or are you able to share the screen now? Many yeah. at once? For some reason, I'm, I'm unable to do it from my own computer, but... Uh, okay. And in that case, let me do it for you. And I will put on my... So it's, I think it's very interesting to, um, to, to listen uh, to the previous speakers. Uh, and I think one of the really interesting points we're all brought up is this bias, where it is amazing how people just, they, they love their technique. They, uh, they really um, uh, will stick with it regardless of the data. Um, my uh, disclosures, I'm a consultant for Pentax Boston and Cook. Next slide, please. So just some take home points, please go ahead. So in my opinion, I, I make a distinction between cutting needles, which are the Francine and the fork tip and the scraping needles, which are the reverse bevel. And I think that due to the development of cutting FNA, FNB needles, in my opinion, the whole issue of tissue acquisition has basically been solved. I don't think we can get much better than we're currently doing uh, with these needles and in that respect, if you're not getting good results, it's not the needle, it's you. You need to really improve your technique. And I think the most important thing that I see with the fellows is that they don't move the needle tip adequately inside the lesion. And I don't think you have to move quickly, uh, but you really have to go from, from the, the entire lesion all the way through from one edge to the other edge. We generally go about twice all the way through. Uh, and sometimes you have to push a little harder. You may have to go faster in some lesions that are harder just to get through them completely. Then we come out, uh, we come completely out of the lesion, use the elevator or the up down to go somewhere else into another part. So instead of fanning where I, my feeling is the fanning is more staying inside the lesion and moving around. We literally come out, if we can stay behind the wall then we stay behind the wall and go in somewhere else. But even if you have to come out of the wall and go back in, it's okay. The tissue contamination is not an issue. Uh, multiple studies have shown this now that the, 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 the tissue contamination is there, but it doesn't affect the diagnostic accuracy. So uh, the reason I like to come out of the lesion is that it allows you to really clearly go into a completely different part of the lesion. And in our experience, this has been very successful. Um, we do not use any suction or stylet. So there's multiple randomized trials showing the stylet is of no value. We use it sometimes to push out the sample if it gets stuck inside the needle. Uh, for suction, you know, the, the thing about suction is that it, I think it just, you know, certainly the slow pull, if you measure the suction at the tip, it's actually zero suction. I think the reason slow pull helps some people is because they spend so much time pulling out the stylet that they just sample for a longer period. And if you look at the suction studies that show an advantage for suction, my crit critique of those studies is that the control group is very bad. So it's like the suction doesn't improve the results uh, in the suction group. The reason it looks better is because the control group for some reason is worse. And then you get a, you get a significantly better result. Uh, next, please. So uh, also, as, uh, as I think we're finding now, the, the, the technique of FNA, FNA and FNB are the same uh, for both uh, nodes and masses. And uh, rows may be helpful for FNA, but is no longer needed for FNB. There's a couple of really good randomized trials now showing that, that uh, MOSE is really quite sufficient. Uh, and another reason not to use suction is that it makes MOSE more difficult because it produces more blood in the sample. So you can't uh, uh, as effectively identify the, uh, the white uh, tissue cores. Next, please. So this is an example with suction. So you can imagine that there's some tissue in there, but there's a lot of blood and stuff. And it's really hard uh, in our experience uh, to, to identify the cores. Uh, next, please. So this is what we regularly get with no stylet and no suction. 
So without having a stylet, I think that you yeah, just go back, please. The, I, I think the advantage with no stylet is that first of all, the, you get the most tissue the first time you go into the lesion. And if you have a stylet in the needle, you're actually preventing tissue from getting into the needle on that first, first movement. And also when you pull back the stylet, you do get a, a very small amount of suction enough to pull some blood into the needle. So it does contaminate your specimen with uh, some blood. But you look here with no stylet and no suction, this is the stuff we get all the time, all the time. And so I guess my question for people who are still using the stylet and suction, if I can get this without stylet and suction, how come everybody else needs stylet and suction? I, I don't understand. But I think as you see here, you can really get a, a much better idea if you, if, of whether or not you have tissue if you get less blood in your sample. And as I say, without using the stylet. Next uh, slide, please. So I think Rob showed this as well. Just to point out that if you look at the, the there's just the specimen adequacy, because not all specimens have cancer, but basically we're getting up to 98%, okay? So if you're not getting this kind of result, it's not a needle issue, it's a, it's a technique issue. So if you're not getting this kind of result, you have to look at what you're doing with your technique. And I think you really need to improve your technique. Next. So moving on to the specific uh, topics I was given. For uncinate lesions um, in D2, we're talking about lesions here that are distal to the papilla. I think the short scope is best for most of these lesions because it's, as Nathalie pointed out, you know, when the scope is straight, it's easier to move the needle. I think we, we always use a 22 gauge FNB uh, Francine tip now. And uh, it's really, the 25 is easier to move, but basically, there aren't any cases anymore where we can't really get the, that 22 gauge needle in the right position to get into the lesion. Uh, you may need to use a long scope for some lesions that are very almost bordering on D4. You may need to go long to get in there. And for some reason now uh, with these uh, scopes with have, that have larger channels and with a 22 gauge needle, uh, we found that uh, you still get the good, good uh, ability to move the needle inside the lesion. You may have to push a little harder, but as a general rule, I think with uh, the smaller needles, uh, 22, 25, uh, it's, it hasn't been an issue anymore. I think that the sheaths of the needles now are also harder and uh, they're making it easier to move the needle. Um, in the bulb, uh, sometimes uh, if you're having trouble getting to a lesion in, uh, in D2 or D3, you can actually, uh, if you anchor yourself in the bulb, and I'll show you this in a sec, you can actually uh, push the needle into the wall, push the scope in and get the needle to go, to go pu push the scope and get the needle to go deeper into an uncinant lesion uh, from the bulb. This is, you don't do this too often, <coughs> but in some cases uh, it may help. I do recommend uh, for just to protect your scopes to go into D2, shorten up, then put the, lesion, the needle into the scope. I don't think it's a good idea to be in a long position, certainly, and try and push the needle into the scope. That's where you get uh, uh, a risk of perforating the channel uh, with the needle. So if you can, always try and shorten up, get the scope straight, then put the needle into the scope. And as I say, in the bulb, if you'd want to go deep, try and, and anchor the needle into the wall, uh, do maximum elevator down, and then try and push the scope in if you need to, to get the needle to go a little deeper. Uh, next, please. So here's uh, just a very blurry picture of the scope in a long position uh, where you can get probably to most of these lesions deep in the uncinate. Uh, I think this is the hardest station for people. And, and I think the once the scope is straight, you can generally move the needle. I think what a lot of people have, the problem they have is actually locating lesions in this position. And Rob uh, described how to find uh, the uncinate, how to find the papilla. It's just one of those stations that we work a lot on with the fellows. Um, uh, it's again, a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but, but uh, it's, it's a station where once, you, once it clicks, you get it, and then you find that you generally do uh, find these lesions without uh, too much difficulty. Next slide, please. So this is how I'm describing uh, when you're anchored in the bulb. Here, the, the needle is going sort of straight towards uh, D2. But as I say, if you're having trouble getting deep into the uncinate there, 
you can just put the needle into the wall, max elevator down, and then push the scope in, and it will push the needle a little deeper into that deep, deep, deep uh, unsniff portion there. This may be helpful, especially in cases where there's a duodenal stricture due to the tumor and you can't access uh, D2. Next uh, slide, please. Tail lesions now, moving on to tail lesions. Honestly, I don't find tail lesions particularly difficult. The scope is straight uh, and usually, you know, uh, they're fairly large lesions. They're patients that present with inoperable uh, pancreatic body lesions. Gastric varices may be an issue, uh, but basically just don't uh, go through a varix. I don't recall ever having induced a, a, a variceal bleed by, by going, uh, uh, doing an FNA in a person or an FNB in somebody who had gastric varices, but by all means, uh, try and avoid going straight through a, a gastric varus. varus. Um, the issue for me is tumor seeding. And uh, we uh, have definitely had uh, published at least one case of tumor seeding in a small lesion that was uh, totally intrapancreatic. And by doing multiple passes and going through the gastric wall, the patient came back with a um, tumor invasion in the gastric wall. So we basically converted a T1 lesion into a T4 lesion. So I, I think that uh, it, it's a consideration, particularly lesions that look potentially operable. In some situations, um, I think now, uh, it's reasonable still to do at least one pass, but if you can look for another lesion, a distant lesion, um, uh, which would be obviously increase the staging and avoid you going through the gastric wall and biopsy the primary lesion only if it will change management. If the patient's going to go to surgery anyway, and there's a risk of tumor seeding, then I think you can avoid the biopsy and just go straight to surgery. And as I say, we tried in these cases, traverse the wall only once. So we go through the wall, and as I described uh, with our, uh, what I call a multi-pass technique, into the lesion, move a few times, pull back out of the lesion, but stay behind the wall and go somewhere else. And uh, in this way, I think we, we, we really minimize the risk of tumor seeding. I, I think these days now, the, this concept of going to surgery without a tissue diagnosis is certainly in our institution, it's not really acceptable. Uh, because there is a small proportion of patients who have like autoimmune pancreatitis, focal pancreatitis, or something that basically does not uh, warrant uh, uh, pancreatectomy. Next slide, please. So this is what I mean uh, in this multi-pass technique. On the left, you see just going through the wall, coming out, going back through the wall in multiple places. As I say, if, if, you, if you can't find any space in between the, the mass and the wall, I still think this is okay, uh, particularly in the duodenum, since the since the the, the surgical specimen includes the the wall, uh, and uh, contamination with wall tissue is not an issue, and the wall tissue does not block the needle. This is what the the randomized trials with the stylet have shown, because when you push through the tumor, you do get wall, but it gets pushed physically up into the needle, and it, it does not prevent you from getting tissue. So on the right side is the multi-pass technique where we go in once, move, come back, stay between the wall and the tumor, and then go back into multiple places. And by coming out of the tumor, it frees up the needle to really go into a different part of the, of the tumor. And I think uh, this improves uh, your chances of getting uh, uh, a diagnosis um, in these larger lesions. Remember in larger lesions, the actual tumor uh, may be hidden uh, amongst some, some uh, obstructive pancreatitis. And uh, I recommend in these situations as well to go, go where the stricture is or go where you see no dilated structures. If you see any dilated structures, that can't be tumor. So when you follow the stricture, usually you'll get to a point where you'll, you'll see the mass and there's zero dilated structures. And in adenocarcinomas, you'll see sometimes little microcalcifications. That's where the money is. That's where you wanna focus uh, your biopsies. Next slide, please. Just moving on now to subcenter centimeter uh, neuroendocrine tumors are just, they're, they're not all uh, nets, uh, these uh, small lesions. Sometimes they can be uh, focal pancreatitis, they can be splenules, uh, they can be mets from other things. So I think tumor seeding is still an issue. These are intrapancreatic lesions, so they're theoretically curable. So again, I think you wanna minimize the passes, just only one pass. And in these lesions, they're small lesions. So even if you get a, a negative biopsy, 
most of the time, the follow-up will be the same. It'll be radiological surveillance. And uh, I don't think uh, aggressively biopsying these things, which increases the risk of, of tumor seeding, is really worth it, except maybe for uh, symptomatic insulinomas, where you, I think you do need a, uh, a tissue diagnosis if you want to move on to a treatment like RFA. Uh, some of these lesions, uh, if they're, for example, fulcrum pancreatitis, can be very hard and rubbery, and that can be an issue. Uh, so I recommend in these situations, and this applies to, mo to very mobile lymph nodes as well, break down the technique. So first, get through the wall. Uh, and it's true with a Francine needle, uh, especially if you've done multiple passes, the needle can get a little, I think, blunt, and going through the wall can be an issue. So get as perpendicular to the wall as possible, puncture through, and then slowly work your way into the pancreas and then go up against the, the lesion and then uh, do your, your actual puncture. And uh, if the lesion is quite mobile or quite hard, you may uh, need to use what uh, Rob uh, taught me as the shish kebab technique, where you just uh, really go very quickly and try and just go right through the lesion. And again, I think in, if you want to maximize your yield in the situation, you really have to go through the lesion completely in many different places, especially if you're going to do only one pass. And in our experience, it's been very successful. Uh, some of these neuroendocrine tumors have a central necrotic component. In that situation, um, you may want to put some suction on to aspirate that part of it as well. We don't do that, and we still manage to get a, a diagnosis, I say, in more than 95% of the cases. And I think that's the last slide. Uh, next, please. Yeah, and I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to an animated discussion. Thank you, Anand, for this wonderful talk. And that brings us to the last uh, topic, which will be presented by Dr. Surinder Rana, who is a professor at the Department of Gastroenterology at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Chandigarh, India. And Surinder is one of the you know, absolute uh, wonderful teachers of EUS and uh, stalwarts of EUS in India. He's going to be speaking on EOS diagnosis in cystic pancreatic lesions, particularly related to the imaging, the cyst fluid analysis, and the role of FNB. So over to you, Surinder. Uh, thanks, Amol, and thanks, Suptesh. Uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to participate in such a great uh, educational event. And we have heard three wonderful talks on uh, utility of US FNA in various lesions. And uh, we all have been witness to the fascinating journey of US in achieving histological diagnosis of various lesions. And we have reached an accuracy of more than 95% for most of the lesions uh, with US and FNA and FNB. But the frontier which still remains to be conquered is cystic lesions. And in next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about the strengths and limitations of EUS imaging as well as FNA in pancreatic cystic lesions. So whenever we see a pancreatic cystic lesion, the first issue is to determine whether it's benign or malignant. The second issue is if we determine it to be benign, whether it's mucinous or non-mucinous. And if it is mucinous, we need to determine the risk of malignancy during the lifetime of the patient and therefore advocate an appropriate treatment for a mucinous cyst. So let's look at these challenges. But before I go on to the role of EUS, we do have a number of studies which have documented some important points. One, the risk of malignancy in incidentally detected pancreatic cystic lesions is low. That means majority of these lesions will not require resection. But the challenge for us is to identify the ones which require resection from the majority which do not re require resection. And then we have the factors which are associated with increased risk of malignancy, which include the cyst size of more than three centimeter, the solid component within the cyst, and finally the dilated pancreatic duct. So these are the three important factors on imaging which determine the risk of malignancy. So let's look at the imaging. <clears throat> I think of all the non-invasive imaging modalities, contrast enhanced MRI remains the gold standard. I won't say the gold standard, but the imaging modality of choice 
for evaluating the cystic lesions because it has a clear advantage over a CT scan in displaying the inner structure of pancreatic cystic lesions. And the similar accuracy has been shown by contrast enhanced endoscopic ultrasound. Another important fact to remember is that morphology either on CEUS or CEMRI is not always able to reliably identify exact type of pancreatic cyst. And therefore, an EUS FNA as an, is an important adjunct to imaging. But over last 10 to 15 years, we have seen that EUS FNA is still largely suboptimal in accurately diagnosing pancreatic cyst. And I'll just briefly summarize the literature around the FNA in next few slides. And therefore, there is a need for developing novel techniques for accurate diagnosis of pancreatic cystic lesions. So when we do an EUS, what do we look at? We look at size and number of cysts. We look at the cyst wall morphology, try to look for mural nodule. We try to look for communication between the cyst and the pancreatic duct. And then we also try to look for any background lesions as well as lymphadenopathy. And then the commonly encountered cystic lesions include one serous cystic tumor, which has a relatively classical appearances on EUS where you will see microcysts with honeycomb appearance. And sometimes you can have a central echogenicity suggesting a central calcification. On the other hand, IPMN is a close mimicker of chronic pancreatitis where you will see a dilated main pancreatic duct. But on EUS, you can document polypoidal lesions inside the dilated pancreatic duct in patients with IPMN. Mucinous cysts usually don't have any specific appearances on EUS. You will usually see a macrocystic appearances. Occasionally, the cyst may be oligoceptated. You may find peripheral calcifications. There might be a solid component, and there you will see a regional adenopathy when the cyst is malignant and has involved the lymph nodes. SPEN, again, has a solid and cystic components, not a very classical appearances, and you will probably require a tissue acquisition to accurately diagnose a solid papillary pseudoepithelial neoplasms. And finally, pseudocysts are, you will have an equate thick wall structure. You will have a background changes of pancreatitis and very rarely septations may be seen. But then, except for serous cyst adenoma, none of these EUS features are specific for any of these uh, cystic lesions. And therefore, you need to proceed further I'll just go through the classical images. This is the classical microcystic appearances with central echogenicity in serous cyst adenoma. This is what is a mural nodule looks like on an endoscopic ultrasound. You will have the cyst with a uh, echogenic structure suggesting a mural nodule. And this is how uh, SPEN will appear. SPEN will appear a well demarcated lesions with few anechoic areas. So it will have a variable echogenicity. But again, the appearances is not very classical for a particular type of uh, tumor. And then, therefore, it's important to do a EUS FNA. That means you try to aspirate the cyst. But again, apart from certain classical situations, like sometimes you may find a thick mucin coming out, then you can confidently diagnose a mucinous cyst. Or sometimes you aspirate and you get this chylus fluid. This would suggest a lymph lymphangioma. But apart, apart from these situations, the utility of EUS FNA is very, very limited especially in cytology because the specimen is posicellular. There are few studies which have shown that doing cytology brushings from the wall of the cyst may improve the yield of USFNA. But again, the sensitivity and specificity is far from satisfactory. And therefore, it has got a very poor sensitivity for diagnosis of potential malignant or malignant cysts. So because of limitation of cytology, we go on for tumor markers. And of all the markers which have been studied, the CEA has been the one which is most commonly used and the widest literature available on this tumor marker. If we look at the original study, which looked at the cystic fluid CEA cutoff of 192 nanogram per ml, the sensitivity was 63% and specificity was 93% for identifying mucinous cystic lesions. But then thereafter, subsequent studies have shown a variable cutoff with variable sensitivity and specificity, including one study from our center where we found that CE of 45 nanogram per ml had a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 96.8%. It is important to remember that higher level does not mean the cyst is malignant, but higher likelihood that the cyst is mucinous, and therefore there is no direct correlation of CEA concentration with malignancy. So because of poor sensitivity of CEA, 
We have tried looking for other markers, which include molecular markers, the cyst fluid DNA, the cyst fluid glucose levels, and proteomic mucin profiling. Just to summarize the results of these markers, KRAS is the one which has been commonly studied, but again has a sensitivity of 45 to 65%. And although the specificity, specificity is quite high, up to 96 to 100% for detecting mucinous pancreatic cystic neoplasms. But on comparison with CEA, the diagnostic accuracy is almost similar. There were a few studies which have looked at the amount of DNA, and these studies have shown that high amount of DNA with high amplitude of allelic loss is associated with malignancy. But again, the results have not been reproduced by other studies. Then somatic mutations in GNAS gene, it is highly specific for IPMN. But again, it is not associated with dysplasia, great or carcinoma, and has a very low sensitivity. Then there have been an attempts to look at mutations in a number of tumor suppressor genes. These all have been associated with IPMN with high-grade dysplasia or invasive carcinoma. Then there have been mutations looked at in VHL, which are specific for serocystic neoplasm, and mutations in CTTNB1 gene, which are associated with SPEN. But all these markers and mutational analysis have the same problem of uh, poor sensitivity. All the specificity is very high. And recently, a cheaper marker, which includes a low pancreatic cyst fluid glucose, which is less than 50 milligram per deciliter, has been shown to have a diagnostic accuracy comparable to CEO alone for diagnosis of mucinous pancreatic cystic neoplasms. So therefore, because of the limitations of fluid analysis, we have the need of developing novel techniques. So one is a confocal uh, endoscopy microscopic evaluation, which is a real-time microscopic evaluation of the surface epithelium. Here you use a 19-gauge needle and pass this probe into the cyst and try to look at the cyst wall microscopic. And it has been shown to have a superior diagnostic accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity compared to either EUS alone or EUS FNA. However, this technique has limitations which include high cost, steep learning curve, and moderate inter-observer agreement. Other thing is to use a direct visualization of cyst wall with a spyglass probe. The presence of mucin is the one which is, has shown a significant association on a spyglass visualization with mucinous cyst. However, the limitations are that it produces suboptimal images. And the recent studies have shown that this technique has more promise when it is used in conjunction with US guided confocal laser endoscopy. That means you first visualize the lesion in the cyst wall and then use a targeted uh, endomicroscopy. Finally, then there have been also attempts to improve the tissue acquisition. So in that line is development of microbiopsy forceps where the targeted tissue samples are obtained from cyst walls, septa, or mural nodules. And the studies have shown it to be superior to USFNA in a, obtaining poor specimens. And there is high level of concordance with post-operative pathology. Uh, however, you know, you're only able to provide information on focal pieces of cyst. So now there have been studies which have used a combination of confocal laser endoscopy with targeted biopsy and this, these are showing promising results, and we need to see whether they will improve the diagnostic accuracy in pancreatic cystic lesions. An important consideration with microbiopsy forceps is increased incidence of adverse effects, including bleeding and pancreatitis, which has been seen up to 20% of patients undergoing tissue acquisition with microbiopsy forceps. So after summarizing the literature, I'll just run through some of the images and videos of the cystic lesions. So this is a patient with a cystic lesion on US. You can see it's an oligoceptated lesions with some mural nodules. And the advantage is when you do a contrast EUS, in contrast, you can, you can see the septa as well as the mural nodule highlighting with this contrast. So this suggests a high likelihood of a mucinous cyst uh, with probably dysplasia. Another example, and again, you see a cystic lesion with a mural nodule. And when you do a contrast EUS, the advantage of doing a contrast EUS is that you can differentiate the mucus plugs, which sometimes can be seen in cystic lesions with a true mural nodule. Here you can see the mural nodule is lighting up with the contrast, suggesting it to be a tissue proliferation. Another similar example, a small lesion you can see on uh, uh, EUS. And when you do a contrast EUS, you will find it to be highlighting the contrast, suggesting it to be a mural nodule. And then once you see a mural nodule, you can attempt a tissue acquisition also. So here you can see first the cyst fluid has been aspirated. Here in this case, a 22 gauge needle was used. 
So therefore, it was because of thick mucus in the cyst, fluid could not be aspirated. And then you sample the mural nodule. And in this patient, we got a diagnosis of mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma. But always, you're not always right. There are a lot of difficult cases. Just to highlight this one example, you see a dilated duct. And if you see carefully, you see a sort of a proliferation, a polypoidal lesion in the pancreatic duct. Similar changes were seen in MR. Here you could see some strictures also, but the only thing was this was a young female, 30 year old, likelihood of IPMN is less, but still we did an EUS. When we did an EUS, again, you find the dilated duct, but you don't see classical changes of pancreatitis in this patient on EUS. And then on a careful US examination, you find this sort of a hypoechoic lesion protruding inside the pancreatic duct. So since there was a strong suspicion of IPMN and person was female, the surgeons asked us to obtain a histological diagnosis. So we did an EUS FNA. On EUS FNA, you can see if it's a true polypoidal lesion, you will have very limited mobility of the lesion once you pass needle in and out. And you can see the fluid inside the mucin moving. So that's what we witnessed in this patient. And the cytology was negative for malignancy. So we went ahead with a pancreatoscopy in this patient to get a confident diagnosis. So you can see the dilated side branches. You can see the small calcifications inside the ducts or ductal calculi are seen. Again, being brought out here in this view. And then we, there was a stricture from which we sampled. And this biopsy was suggestive of chronic pancreatitis. Another difficult lesion, again, you see a cystic lesion in the uncinate, near the uncinate process of pancreas on CT. On EUS, it looks like a complex cystic lesions. Twice attempts at FNA proved to be inconclusive outside. So patient was sent to us. We went ahead with the contrast US. So we found that there was this lesion was enhancing. The rest of the lesions were not enhancing. So in this case, we proceeded ahead with a targeted biopsy using a micro biopsy forceps. So you can see what you do is you use a 19 gauge needle put this 19 gauge needle into the lesion and push the micro biopsy forces outside. And this is how these tissue samples you get. So this was a surprise diagnosis to us. This was a tubicular lymphadenopathy with cystic lesions because of necrosis. So finally, to summarize, these are three important points which all endosonologists while doing an EUS for cystic lesion should remember. First question is, do all cystic neoplasms need to be evaluated with EUS? Answer is no. In some cases, the clinical and imaging findings are sufficient to diagnose the lesion with confidence. For example, if you have a 50-year-old healthy female without a history of pancreatitis with a thick, three centimeter thick walled septated cyst in tail of pancreas, it's most likely to be a mucinous cyst and there is no need to proceed ahead with an EUS. Is EUS imaging alone all we need for evaluation of cystic lesion? Again, the answer is no, because as I have talked about, determination of morphology based on EUS is not specific enough. Cyst fluid needs to be evaluated with cytology and tumor markers to have a satisfactory diagnostic accuracy. Should all cysts be aspirated? Answer is again, no, because in some situation, aspiration is not indicated or may even be contraindicated. For example, if you have a classical lobulated microcystic lesion, which suggests serous cyst adenoma, FNA will not add any information. Finally, how many passes should be made to sample a cyst? Typically, one pass is made to acquire fluid. The cyst should be completely aspirated if possible to decrease the risk of infection. And during the same cyst wall pass, the solid lesion may be targeted or the wall may be targeted to increase the cytological yield. And in case the cyst aspiration has been difficult, you want to do a second attempt, a new needle should be used to aspirate the solid component to decrease the risk of infection. So to summarize, unfortunately, EUS is not a panacea in evaluation of pancreatic cystic lesion. It is confounded by subjectivity of interpretation. Predicting malignancy in mucinous cystic neoplasm still remains uh, difficult with the EUS. EUS findings may add some diagnostic information, but to have a confident diagnosis, we need to have cytology as well as chem chemical and genetic analysis of the cyst fluid. And the newer techniques, which I have just talked about, including microbiopsy forceps and confocal confoc laser mic uh, microscopy, hold considerable promise in evaluation of pancreatic cystic lesions. Uh, thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thanks, Surinder, and uh, excellent talks by all our experts. We will uh, start the most uh, important and one of the highlights of this uh, course and the webinar session is interaction of all the participants of the faculties and the experts with the audience. So to begin with, I would just uh, initiate the first question and I would just uh, 
throw it to Rob for now. Uh, it's when to prefer 19 gauge EUS FNB needle and 22 gauge needle uh, as 20, uh, uh, sorry, when to prefer 19 gauge and 22 gauge needle FNB as right now, basically we are just heading towards 22 gauge needle all the time. So when do you prefer 19 gauge? That's the question. Again, there'll be bias, I'm sure, amongst all of the panel, but uh, I can't remember the last time I used a 19 gauge needle when I was doing a tissue acquisition. So uh, other than liver biopsy. So we do liver biopsies with a 19 gauge needle, uh, but uh, in terms of the, the kind of biopsies that we've been talking about, um, I, I don't use a 19 gauge uh, needle anymore. And I agree with Nantali, uh, if it's a really difficult place to get to, uh, then I'll go to, uh, to a 25 gauge needle if I really need some, uh, some serious um, uh, you know, uh, access uh, if, it, if it's quite difficult. Thank you. So liver biopsy is the only reason I use the 19 gauge. I would add there's, there's actually studies looking at 19 gauge for cytology and it's of zero advantage it just makes for a lot of blood and 19 gauge needles are particularly difficult to use uh in d2 uh when the scope is bent etc so i think uh for certainly for cytology it's of uh just there's just no indication right okay so there's another question from dr muhammad uh Probably I would ask Nantali and maybe Anand uh, to answer that. How do you express the tissue from the needle onto the slide and to the formalin? Do you just flush it with air or do you need to push it with the stylet? What's your preferred action and how do you do that? I, I will go first. When I, when I do the tissue processing with our pathologist, they prefer pushing the um, aspirates with air, just flush air flush and that's it. But when I do it for myself, um, I generally use the stylet because I've, I've found that when I flush it with air, it just kind of, you know, all over the um, the glass slide. So I, you know, I think you can do either way. I don't think it matters very much, but my pathologist seems to like doing the air flush. Whichever way you do though, you have to, you want to kind of do it quickly. Otherwise it's going to clot inside the needle and that's going to create problems. Right. And Anand, do you use the, the stylet to push No, it? we use, uh, we use uh, just air for 99%. Uh, Sometimes if it gets blocked in the needle, we'll push it out with the stylet. Uh, I do recommend using the stylet though for liver biopsy because it uh, helps uh, keep the core intact. So push it out slowly with the stylet uh, for liver. But for uh, everything else, uh, we just use air. And since we're doing no more slides, we just uh, push it all into the formalin. And I would add that there is a, it's never been tested, but there, I don't know what other people think, there is a sound you get when you know you've got tissue, uh, like somebody kind of spitting and you hear that sound and you're like, okay, that's for sure gonna be positive. It's like, it's just a, a particular sound you get when you have a very good sample. I love the shish kebab technique and the spitting sound. This is... <laughs> So the question for uh, Surinder now, um, is it useful to use a more micro forceps to take biopsy from a suspected cystic neoplasm of pancreas? Yeah, definitely a more for biopsy forceps will increase the histological yield in a cystic lesion, but that does not mean that for all cystic lesions, you have to use a, a more biopsy forceps. I think you need to characterize which lesions, you know, you want to sample with more biopsy forceps. Like if you have a symptomatic cyst more than three centimeter and you are anyway planning resection, then there is no need to go ahead with a, a microbiopsy forceps. But sometimes you will have a cyst two to three centimeter in size uh, or a patient is uh, not fit for surgery. You want a confident diagnosis. You have made an attempt, one at aspiration, and the diagnosis has not been achieved despite the cyst being aspirated. Maybe the second attempt with a biopsy forceps probably would give you a confident diagnosis. But again, you know, the exact indications uh, still need to be standardized there because one, this needle is not widely available, this forceps. And secondly, we have very limited number of uh, prospective randomized studies which have looked at the more biopsy forceps vis-a-vis -vis other techniques. Thank you. So, 
Rob, this is a question for you, maybe, and maybe Surinder can also take it up because he spoke on cystic lesions. This is kind of a cyst. Can FNB be performed for a gallbladder mass? And what's the risk of causing a leak in a gallbladder after FNA or FNB? Yeah, so it's a, a good question uh, without a, a whole lot of uh, experience. But the bottom line is for me, uh, for instance, if I'm in a, any kind of an area where a vascular, I might uh, punct, puncture a, a vessel, uh, something like the, the gallbladder perhaps, then I tend to use the, the old bevel uh, needle. I don't use the, the uh, FNB type of needles. Um, they're quite aggressive and uh, they can lacerate things. And, and uh, so I'm, uh, if I were doing a gallbladder, uh, I think, um, first of all, I would, I would try to access it with, uh, with there being surrounding tissue as opposed to going freely through the, the wall. Uh, I would try to make only one pass and then I would do rows and, and see if I have enough to make a diagnosis. And I would probably not use an, uh, an FNB needle under that circumstance. So, Surinder, so you have any other ideas? Yeah, I think I agree with Rob what he's saying. You know, first is I think the clinical indications of performing an EUS FNA from a gallbladder mass would be very limited because if you have a lesion which is symptomatic and resectable, I think it, it would be much wiser to go ahead with a cholecystic in such patients. But then occasionally you do find patients who either are unfit for surgery or the surgeons want you to have a histological diagnosis before they go ahead with a surgery. In that situation, we do have attempted an uh, FNA and even FNB from the gallbladder. So I think few things which we look at is what is the thickness of the wall which we are going to puncture. Uh, we avoid directly going into the gallbladder. We prefer going it through a uh, liver so that there is no leakage. And then we try avoiding directly getting into the lumen of the gallbladder. So we try to ensure having a thickness of at least having 10 millimeter or more before we puncture the gallbladder. So most of the patients where we had used a FNB needle are the ones with polypoidal masses into the gallbladder and we avoid getting into the GB lumen. If I may add, you know, gallbladder cancer is, they're, they're really a mess. Like there's really hard, I find a lot of times to see where, where what's, co what's cholecystitis versus cancer. I, I would recommend if it's a suspected gallbladder cancer, the first thing to try and look for is a node. If you can do a node that looks suspicious, that's much safer. And that's the thing. If you're going to needle the gallbladder, stay in the mass. Never, I think, go into the, the, uh, the fluid part of the gallbladder if you can. Uh, and I would add that uh, you're, if other people have the same experience, gallbladder cancers all have like one huge stone. And uh, if you see this, this huge stone with kind of a mass uh, component to it, that's, that's very suspicious. And our experience has been pretty safe going through the mass part. We haven't had any leaks to my knowledge or anything like that. But I think you start looking for distant lesions. And then uh, if you have to uh, go, go into the gallbladder. It's hard to distinguish gallbladder cancer, for example, like from Maritzi syndrome sometimes and stuff like that. Uh, it's it's really quite uh, quite difficult. Yeah. So there's a question for all the educators because we all teach fellows. Um, in your experience, how many diagnostic ultrasound do you need before you try doing therapeutic ultrasound? It's open to everybody. <laughs> So let me, because I know Rob, Rob and I differ on this. I, I think, you know, okay, uh, therapeutic, and I think we're talking about FNB here. To me, um, if you've got reasonable control of the scope, needling like a four centimeter pancreatic mass, it's hard to get into too much trouble doing that. Uh, so I, I, you know, we tend to, uh, if it's something really easy, uh, I think uh, it's reasonable to start doing FNA under with supervision uh, fairly soon, um, just so they can learn, you know, the physically what it takes to get into the mass, et cetera, how to direct the needle and stuff like that. I don't think you need to have done hundreds of US's uh, to, to be able to do that, uh, you know, fairly safely. So and, uh, do you have a number? Oh, I'm sorry, Rob, you, you, you go ahead. No, uh, I just, um, I think a couple of things. I think number one, we don't have any data. Uh, and number two, uh, there has been a shift, I think, in EUS training from when I began 
when I began uh, both with ERCP as well as with uh, EUS, you had to do so, so many hundreds of diagnostic uh, EUSs and we were using radioscopes and then you had to, to practice on linear. And then if you got so many scopes, then you, you got to do an FNA and, and so on and so forth. And I, I think that uh, it's all meshed together now. Um, and, and so I think it varies from person to person. Uh, I think um, that with, with um, you know, some experience uh, with a linear, as, as Anand said, if you've got a, a four centimeter mediastinal uh, lymph node, uh, you almost can't, can't uh, mess that up. And so I think we begin doing FNA early on in, in the right circumstance. So I, I, I think it's, um, it's more of a, of a moving target. Uh, and I don't think that there are numbers out there where you have to do so many of this uh, before you, you move on to FNA or intervention. I think that with intervention, it depends on, on what intervention you're talking about, because some of them are, are really quite difficult. A hepatico J genostomy, uh, I would not allow um, a, a fellow to do unless they had really an extraordinary amount of experience. Also, a lot of the intervention, it depends on your ERCP experience. Um, a lot of the interventions require uh, guide wire exchanges and equipment that we would normally use in ERCP. So I think that has to be uh, factored in the, to when you begin intervention as well. Sorry, Nantali, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was gonna, I was gonna echo what um, what you just said. I, I think that EUS, FNA or FNB is, is a bit different from like real interventional EUS, like biliary um, guided drainage or pancreatic duct drainage. So I think that for FNA, um, uh, we can start teaching FNA early on. I think it really depends on the skill of the fellow. Having said that, I found that each, um, each company of um, echoendoscope may have different angles where the needle would come out. So if you are um, trained by using Olympus, when you start doing Pentax, you might have a different needle angle. So basically you, you're just gonna have to, um, to gauge the, the skills of your fellow and, and, and advise them or supervise them uh, closely when they start doing the FNA. And then, you know, after that point on, I think, I think, you know, um, uh, they, they can start doing FNAs and, and interventional later on, especially the more difficult ones. It also <laughs> used to be, you know, that we started out with radial uh, and now the radial is a dinosaur and, and it's hardly ever used. So fellows from day one uh, are used to a linear scope. Uh, so that's a, a big difference in, in terms of training. That's true. I different opinion about this. Actually, as Alan mentioned, a four centimeter mass in the pancreas or say a six or seven centimeter cyst to be punctured is probably much easier than to diagnose a three or four millimeter stone in a non-dilated bile duct at the ampulla. And very often the, both these things go hand in hand. So, you know, depending on the size of the lesion that you're targeting or something of that sort, you know, you may want your fellows to try their hand at the, at the needle as well as during the training process, but at the same time, sometimes confidently reporting a normal EUS probably is the last thing that a person does. Where, and, you know, that probably certifies competency. So that sometimes becomes the hardest part because that person, the, the endocrinologist has to be confident to report it as a normal EUS and have to be sure that he's not missed something, he or she, of course. So it's that that kind of a thing. So probably it goes hand in hand. Well, we have a lot of more questions. I think uh, many questions on EUS liver biopsy. I think that's the next big thing that is happening. So, so there are, there's a multitude of questions. I'm going to put all of them together. So which needle to use? Then do you use suction technique? And... Uh, whether 19 or 22 gauge, and uh, and would you use a dryer versus a wet heparin, and do you fan in a liver, liver biopsy or no fanning? So, who's going to take that up? Meaning, I, I would. Can, I can start off to cause some problems. So, so I use a 19 gauge regular 19 gauge needle. The the 
the 19 gauge um, cutting needle uh, Francine is very expensive. And the regular 19 is, you know, I think it's less than half the price. With that needle, the goal here is to get uh, just enough portal tracks for a, for a diagnosis. You may not get as many as you would with uh, percutaneous needles and stuff like that. But I just use a regular 19 gauge needle. I try to go through the capsule only once. I go in, do a couple of movements, and there's actually some data showing that more than three is actually not necessary. And then I, I do use suction, but not any, I just use dry suction, but I connect the, the needle to the, the suction device to the, to the needle. And then I just open it like for a second and close it just enough to pull the sample up into the needle to make room when I do another movement for more tissue. Because if you do too much suction, then you just get a lot of blood, which again, makes it hard to identify, I think the, uh, the sample. And so with that technique, we've had a really, really good success. And um, uh, I, I would recommend also pushing out, as I say, the sample with the stylet, so it doesn't break up, push it out very slowly. And I'm, I'm realizing now we do get a little bit of blood. What some people I see do is they have a little filter and they put the sample into the filter and then they can rinse off the blood and they can make sure they have a sample. I think that can be very helpful. Well, I can go after Anand because my practice is completely different from his practice. <laughs> Just create more problems. <laughs> So um, I use 22 gauge needle. I, I don't do 19 because I've had more blood with the 19. I also use wet suction using heparin. So I pre-fill the, um, the column of the needle and the suction with the heparin. I find that using heparin, I get a better core and less blood when I expel the samples. Uh, when I when I expel the sample, I also use stylet, just just what you do, Anand. And I have tried both using filter and without filter. What I found is that when I um, when, when when I expel the um, the sample onto a filter, I get more fragmented tissue as opposed to long core tissue, and I'm not, I'm not sure why that is the case. Uh, having having said that, the pathologists are very happy with the uh, the kind of tissue that we've sent them, and we've got uh, pretty adequate portal tracks. So that that's my technique. As far as the aspiration technique, I do very similar to what you've done. No more than three to and fro. So I would like to add to that. Uh, I used to do initially. I started liver biopsy, and that time non thinly just like you, we were doing uh, twenty two gauge needle. And then recently, um, uh, after looking at the Geisinger group who has uh, initiated the liver biopsy uh, and they have a big contribution to this, uh, I've started the heparin wet suction technique and uh, only three passes as noted in the literature. And my pathologists are very happy. We poured uh, the liver biopsy core in the cassette that is a pathology cassettes and uh, flush it with saline and also heparin and then send it over there in the jar. And it has been very helpful compared to what we used to do before. So I, this is what our technique is at Strong Memorial in Rochester. Troop Tesh, what is your definition of three passes? Do you mean that you go three actuations in the Correct. liver and one pass, or do you do three separate passes um, with no, a certain number of actuations? No, it's just three actuations, just one pass, three actuations, yeah. So it has been shown that these uh, from Geisinger has also shown they do it in left lobe as well as the right lobe. Uh, I've just done left lobe till now in my practice uh, and we have got good course at this point. They say there's a 10% miss rate for steatosis if you do only the left lobe. So that's why they do the right lobe yeah. as well. But uh, I'm too lazy to do both lobes. Okay. <laughs> well, there's one more question about the fanning technique. And uh, should we fan the wheel or the elevator? So I think, yeah, so Rob, how do you fan? You do you use a wheel of the scope or do you use the elevator? Or you use both? Bo both. And I, I would agree with Anand uh, if, uh, you, you have to be a little bit careful 
because you do not want to, as, as Anand's slide showed, you don't want to pull the needle all the way into the lumen of the gut, change the direction and go through the lumen uh, or the wall of the gut uh, a second time to do this fanning. Uh, but uh, on a solid pancreatic tumor, if you don't withdraw the needle out of the tumor, it will limit um, the extent to which you can, can biopsy. So uh, you have to go slowly on the withdrawal, but if, if possible, withdraw outside the wall of the tumor. And then I use both up, down, as well as the elevator to get the different uh, trajectories through the tumor. Uh, and as again, as Anand said, start from left to right or right to left, whichever one, go, go to both ends, but also during the, the uh, actual actuation, go from the part of the tumor that's closest to the transducer all the way to the back of the tumor. So I think that's what we mean by, by fanning. I find the fellows, there's a hesitation to come out of the lesion. Yes. Like I, I tell them, come out, come back, and they, they just stop just before. It's like, no, no, you have to come out. Exactly. And you'll yeah. see once you come out, it really frees up the needle to be able to move it very nicely somewhere else. But sometimes that's only a couple millimeters on it. And, no, exactly. And moving yeah. too fast. And then they, and there's some resistance when you're pulling back. And, and, yeah. uh, but it's, it's very important. All right. Probably this could be the last question. Um, I would address this to Surinder and Nantali. The role of EUS for diagnosis for hydrated cyst, particularly in the pancreas <laughs> and left lobe of liver, and also <laughs> therapeutic options. <laughs> I've seen one in the last 10 years, so I'm going that's to yield to Nantali. That's, that's, that's the reason I said Surinder and Nantali. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a big zero of those. Probably country where hydrated is not that common. I I I think we see no. it in India and Thailand. So yeah. All right, from what I understand, you're not supposed to stick a needle in those things. That that's true. Yeah, that's true. So I I have not yet seen a hydrated cyst in um in a pancreas. I've seen it in the liver. Um, we basically made the diagnosis based on the cross-sectional imaging, CT scan. We did not require an EUS to make the diagnosis um, for hydrated cysts in the left lobe of the liver. I assume that we could do the same in terms of diagnosis um, uh, for uh, pancreatic hydrated cyst. Um, so, you know, like I, I don't know a, um, I don't know a typical finding of a hydrated cyst on EUS, surrender if you know, please enlighten me. But all I know is that we're not supposed to uh, puncture that cyst because it's going to rupture and it's going to create a spillage of the uh, organisms inside. Yeah, I think that that's an important point. Don't stick a needle into a suspected hydrated cyst. We do see pancreatic hydrated, I would say, one case every year. It's a surprise, you know, a cystic lesion of pancreas coming to us for an EUS and FNA. But then on EUS, you beautifully see those daughter cysts. So unless and until the cyst is calcified and is obscuring your EUS view. And if you see those daughter cysts, I think you should, the first reaction should be just to avoid puncturing that cyst because sometimes it can lead on to serious anaphylaxis. And similarly, left lobe of hydrated, again, you can uh, confidently diagnose on EUS by seeing those uh, daughter cysts. Some of these cases we have published in literature and uh, believe me, those images are classical and uh, I don't think so you would miss after you have seen one case of a hydrated cyst with daughter cysts. When, when you say daughter cysts, you don't mean cysts in cysts, right? You yeah, mean you, small cysts? Yeah, you, cyst. yeah, you, yeah you, what you would see is a big cyst with smaller cysts in that and you would see some floating aquagenic materials in that. So, and you, you can very beautifully see those uh, cyst walls or cyst membranes floating inside the cyst. So, so it, it has a relatively classical appearances. US is much better than transabdominal ultrasound to bring out those changes, especially in the pancreatic cystic lesions. In the liver, it's almost similar to a transabdominal ultrasound. So I don't see US having any advantage over transabdominal. Only if you have smaller hydrated cyst, sometimes transabdominal may miss. And on EUS, you can see in left lobe, those 
uh, smaller hiatus cysts. So many times we have seen uh, one or two hiatus cysts reported on transabdominal ultrasound. And when we do an EUS, we find much more cysts in the liver as they have been reported in a transabdominal ultrasound. Is contrast helpful? Uh, we haven't tried contrast in that situation, you know, because contrast is not very freely available in a hospital. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an unsuspected diagnosis. You just get inside the cyst and you find the cyst walls, uh, the daughter cyst. So we haven't tried that. Thank you, guys. That brings us to the end of our uh, question answer session. And I thank all the faculty members uh, for taking out time um, in their busy days and schedule. Uh, to enlighten us with your expertise. And I would hand over to Amol uh, to wrap up the session and also show us our upcoming next webinar. Right. So <clears throat> thank you to all the faculty, Rob, Anand, and uh, Nantra and Sander for being part of this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. I think we learned a lot. I learned a lot for sure. And uh, I'm sure all our attendees learned a lot too. This meeting, this webinar, probably this is our, the, as I mentioned, this is the third in our series and we had the highest participation this time. We had um, 320 participants from all over the globe. Most of them did join in, but I am sure some of them, although they wanted to, they could not because of the time zone differences and things like that. We try and target, you know, the US and the Indian times uh, so that we can most of the globe, but then we understand that in some parts of the world, it may be midnight and beyond that. So they may not be able to join in. <coughs> One of the most beautiful things, wonderful things about this, with these webinars is that once you know we finish this webinar, we'll have the entire recordings of this webinar, which will be uploaded on our free endoscopy YouTube channel. And uh, once you register for this webinar, and once you, you need to log into this, uh, our free endoscopy uh, website and log in uh, and register for the updates regarding the YouTube. And once uh, you will be notified once the webinar is available on YouTube and you can access it only if you have registered for this. So it's not open for everybody so that we make sure that it is protected uh, and it's only within the, uh, you know, the US uh, domain that uh, people can uh, attend this uh, webinar, but they can ask uh, this thing. Obviously, we cannot have any live question answers at that time, but if you have, do have some questions, do try and put in your questions and we'll try, try and get them answered. At the Weevil answer, we'll get one of our faculties to answer. So definitely do that in about, I think uh, probably in about 10, to 10, 10 days to two weeks time, the webinar would be available on the YouTube and you will get notified. Now that brings me to the, Last part of the uh, conclusion, which actually is about the next announcement. And the next, uh, our next webinar, by, because due to popular demand, is on endoscopic hemostasis in non variceal upper GI bleeding. And uh, we, we plan to have it on June 17th. That's basically because although we did want to have it every three months, we all understand that May is DDW month and also a lot of travel all, uh, all around the world. So many of our faculty as well as attendees may not be able to join. So we pushed it by a few weeks to June. The timings will be the same for India. It will be 6.30 in the evening. And for the Eastern, uh, for the US uh, TA group, it will be 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that will be there. Uh, keep watching this space for details for the, uh, the faculty. We have very exciting faculty who will be coming in for this. And again, we promise that this will be an interactive session with a lot of videos and a lot of technical details as to how to perform these EOS this endoscopy hemostasis techniques. And with that, I would like to thank each one of y'all once again for being a part of this uh, wonderful webinar. 
uh, Tripteesh and I enjoyed doing this as much as I'm sure all of you enjoyed attending this webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. And until next time. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.